And we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our quarterly uh, arthroplasty series uh, done with our educational partner, Seattle Science Foundation. Today, we're going to do our arthroplasty uh, kind of back at the roots, um, showing uh, uh, good case, bad case, or not necessarily good, bad, but cases that we learned from. Uh, so I am going to uh, start out, and we, we call this uh, Triumphs and Defeats. And I just want to do a big, a quick shout out. Um, I think we don't give enough credit to our teachers um, along the way. This was one of the best teachers I ever had, uh, who was a pathology uh, uh, professor. And, you know, I, I was all bent out of shape because I missed some important question. He came and put his arm around me and he said, we live for our triumphs, but we learn from our defeats. And I always kind of remembered that. And the second shout out is at the Spine Society Australia meeting that Dr. Blumenthal and I were just at. They do uh, the getting of wisdom uh, on an annual basis, which is lessons from senior surgeons. And, you know, it struck me that we get wisdom as we care for our patients, you know, both from good cases and bad cases. Uh, but we should learn from our experience and, and become better doctors and, and then share that uh, knowledge with our peers. So the getting of wisdom becomes the giving of wisdom. So here are my, uh, here are my two cases. And, and again, thanks to virtual medicine, we're, we're all over the place. So my first case was one that I learned something from, and I'll, I'll subtext that as when you hear hoofbeats, you know, you don't always, it's not always horses. This was a 63 year old guy with uh, two level cervical radiculopathy. Um, and I did uh, a two level uh, disc replacement on him. Um, and he was doing fine until his last visit at three months when he told me that unlike almost every other art cervical disc replacement patient, his range of motion had decreased and his pain had increased. So it made me a little nervous because that's a very unusual finding uh, after we do cervical arthroplasty. So this was him uh, preoperatively. He had two degenerated levels with foraminal stenosis on the appropriate side, failed conservative care, responded appropriately to uh, uh, nerve blocks. Uh, so I was, you know, felt pretty good about recommending arthroplasty um, and decompressed him, put in two cervical discs, and at his two-week and six-week visits, he was delighted because his radiculopathy was completely gone. And then he started aggressive physical therapy, and I saw him back for his three-month visit, um, expecting him to tell me again that he was great and say goodbye, but although he had absolutely no right upper extremity pain, he told me he couldn't really drive well because he couldn't turn his head to the left, and he had a lot of pain when he did that. And uh, when I examined him, he had a lot of spasm and tenderness in his uh, left-sided suboccipital area, his trapezius, um, and he could barely rotate to the left side. And he also hurt on lateral bend and extension. So, I, you know, I could have said to him, uh, just continue with physical therapy and it should get better. But, uh, you know, my hackles were up a little bit. So I, um, even though his x-rays looked good, at certainly at the levels that I operated on, I was a little nervous that I had missed some pathology. So I asked him to get a, a CT scan and come on back and see me. And he did. And um, what I found is he had pretty severe arthritis at C1, C2 on the left side. So when I went into a little more history with him, he had been in a bad motorcycle wreck as a teenager, didn't remember having any neck issues. But um, as you can see, not only has arthritis in his joint, uh, but also looks like he had some uh, injury to his transverse ligament that healed with, uh, with uh, calcium and, and or bone. Um, so, you know, that's uh, pretty impressive, explained his left-sided suboccipital tenderness and his difficulty in rotation. Uh, so, um, you know, how did I miss that? Well, I, I, you know, I mean, I can justify it by saying, uh, you know, he came in with his right arm on his head with cervical radiculopathy, and that's what I kind of focused on. Um, but when I went back and looked at his pre-op films, the, the C1, C2 arthritis was there, but I missed it. So did the radiologist. And it really only became symptomatic when the physical therapist started being a little bit more aggressive. So, I, you know, that's how I can explain it. But, um, you know, the, the, the bottom line here is that patients can have both horses and zebras that may, are making hoof beats, but it's a little more embarrassing when they're both in the same part of the body. You know, it's not like I missed uh, knee pathology. 
So, um, you know, that's uh, a, a, a kind of a thumbs down for me, a, you know, a little sobering that uh, it was more of a defeat than a triumph, although I, I picked it up at the end, at least got the right imaging for him. My second yes. case, um, well, we're going to wait. Let, let's wait till we do the cases. And then um, after both cases, we'll, we'll talk about them. Okay. All right. So um, the second case uh, is about a patient that I did a telemedicine consult on who had uh, a third disc herniation at L5S1 and wanted to know whether he'd be a good candidate for a disc replacement. And um, we've had really good success with that. In 2011, we reported uh, our early uh, experience with three cases as late as 2023. Uh, there were publications about using arthroplasty for recurrent disc herniations instead of automatically fusing patients. So, uh, you know, it is catching on. So I did this telemedicine consultation. This kid, uh, guy, young guy, had um, had had two microdiscectomies, last one a couple of years ago, and now he had a third recurrence uh, with back pain uh, that was still greater than leg pain, but not responsive to conservative care. His surgeon offered him either a third decompression or a decompression and fusion, and he wanted to know whether he'd be a candidate for arthroplasty. And you know, right, right off the bat, I, I thought he he would be a good candidate for it. But on telemedicine, I asked him to show me his range of motion, and he was hurting with extension, particularly left-sided extension um, and relief with flexion. Uh, so although uh, arthroplasty for recurrent disc herniation we think is a really good indication, you got to make sure that uh, there's not some other pathology that, that you're missing, that he doesn't have uh, zebras and horses. So these are the films that he sent for his consultation. You can see his microdiscectomy. I think this was the last one, the second one was docked at the appropriate level. He didn't have the most uh, impressive recurrence, but he, he does have blunting of his root takeoff. He might have a small um, sequestered fragment, but he predominantly had back pain. He has degenerative disc with uh, modic changes. Um, but I asked him to get a CT scan and send it to me for a second consultation. And on the CT scan, it was really just on a single one of the sagittal reconstructions and on a single one of the axials where yeah, I was pretty suspicious that he had uh, a, an iatrogenic or at least a stress pars fracture, um, also not mentioned by the radiologist at all in their report. But, um, you know, I've seen that before. So uh, the question is whether that's um, still active and making him symptomatic. So I asked him to get a CT, a spec CT scan. Um, that showed a significant amount of uptake uh, right at that area. Um, also, the radiologist uh, wasn't so impressed with it, said it was just evidence of degenerative facet disease, but we all know that that's not the case. So uh, with his uh, recurrent disc, degenerative disc, and PARS injury that's still active, um, I, I told him I didn't feel he was a candidate for arthroplasty and that our procedure of choice would be to offer him a a fusion. Um, in our place, it would be a, a, a ALIF and percutaneous screws, but I told him there are lots of ways to do this that um, you know, whatever surgeon he presented himself to, if they could defend it and tell him that in their experience, that was the, the way they like to do it, that I thought that was the most reasonable option for him. So uh, the lesson here is to be cautious that work up anybody who's had prior uh, decompressive surgery, you know, not so much if you did it, but even if you did it, it's a good idea. But certainly if you're inheriting someone else's uh, prior decompression, you should get a CT scan and be very suspicious of other issues than a, a recurrent disc herniation that can, can give you trouble. So this guy also had, uh, you know, hoof beats, but he had horses and zebras. Um, but I felt a little bit better on this one that I didn't dig myself uh, into a hole and um, and find out you know later on. So those are uh, those are my two presentations. And um, we what we're going to do on this format is each one of us will have fifteen minutes to give you two cases and then leave a, about five minutes or so for questions or discussions for those two cases. So and, uh, and you got six, six minutes, minutes, Jack. Yeah. So Jack, uh, I have a question for you. For wait, the very I was going to ask a question first. And I got I already okay. got Nick's okay. other questions. Scott, so go yeah, ahead. Scott butted in first. Go okay, ahead. well, you're wasting time. All right, so I have a question for two of, of our faculty on these cases. The first case um, to Jens. Now, obviously, we see a lot of patients with cervical radiculopathy and appropriately treated with, you know, what Jack did that also have C12. 
would this patient benefit from a C12 fusion in your hands? That's question number one. And then question number two, on the second case for Terry Marnay, don't you think you could still do a ProDisc on that on that case that Jack showed? So I'll sit back. So uh, Terry, why don't you go first on case two because we have it fresh in our memory. Uh, I have okay. the same question for Terry. Uh, oh, I think I would have hesitated, but uh, hesitation because we see the, on the spec scans a very, very inflama inflammation and probably arthrosis on the, the sacroiliac joint. At the opposite, above the disc are perfect. There is no black disc above. So uh, there is no, above it's good, below is bad. Uh, I would have preferred before to fuse as below it would be uh, good too, then the SI joint would have been uh, good. But it seems for me it's a pathology that has never been described for the moment I am working on. This guy has very good lumbar disc, except the L5S1. And he has a sacroiliac, very inflammatory. That means that it's not a lumbar disease, it's a sacrum disease. And the three pieces articulated on the sacrum, the cardan shaft between L5-S1 and the 2-SI joint as a disease. So, so we have nothing to really be anxious about the disc above. It's not a lumbar degenerative disease. It's a pure L5-S1 associated with probably a, a sacrum and pelvic dysfunction. That means that the three parts are suffering. That's why there is a fact facet, we can, typically we don't see that type of uh, spontaneous facets uh, in degenerative spines so easily. Here it's very, very strange, it's unique. So I think that is a part of the pathology. So typically, my uh, opinion would have been to save the disc and to restore the disc to, uh, to have a release of the sacroiliac joint uh, and not to be to be obliged to fuse them uh, as uh, it is uh, fashion now, uh, but the facet fracture, the two or three times he has got a discectomy, makes me think that uh, don't ask too much to our disc. So mm. I would perhaps t fifteen years ago I would be more aggressive. Today I would have been more careful and I would have fused exactly a three sixty as you have done. Jens, was, was that your question? This is, yeah, this is a great case because we have a similar one that came to me. I get to be the repository for all these failed disc arthroplasties from Germany and other places. And I don't know why that is, but I had a virtually identical case who had a uh, um, stress fracture post discectomy after a decompression was done by elsewhere after a, a lumbar disc arthroplasty and that actually healed uh, so his was pretty acute and i then got to follow him and uh, he actually healed the stress fracture i think that the mechanics of such a stress fracture are probably a little bit or a spondylolisthesis like what you did what are your thoughts jack i mean you you guys ran the trials and a unilateral spondylolysis um, is mechanically um, reflective of some overload of the posterior arch, but not necessarily destabilizing the segment. Um, yeah, I, you know, these were exclusions from the FDA study. And so that we didn't have any prospective randomized, uh, you know, data on pars fractures. We had to avoid them in the study. Um, we had one inadvertent one who did fine for a few years and then ultimately we did PARS repairs on him to save his disc and his long-term follow-up has been quite good. But I think if you find the, a fracture like this, um, uh, I, I was would be hesitant to offer a disc because if it failed or if he continued to have pain, you couldn't control it. Um, you know, you'd be looking, you'd be looking bad. Sure. Let me, yep. Let me try yeah. to save a minute here. I'm just having trouble finding how I stop sharing. Uh, let's, I don't know how to do that. Can one of you take over without me stopping yep. sharing? Or? You, I stopped it for you. You're yeah, okay. I think oh, you stopped her. Thank God. Okay. All right. So let's go on to Dr. Shellock. Jess, you want to 
take over? Yep. Let me we'll, let me get my screen shared here. We'll start your clock. Okay. Um, it's not letting me. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for having us and for letting me present. So, all right, my uh, first case here. Um, this was a 53 year old lady that came to see me with. 10 years, progressive low back pain, some L5 paresthesias on the left side, um, had been kind of slowly progressive over many years, but exacerbated, particularly in the last few months, there wasn't any specific injury or anything like that. Pretty active, um, active woman. Um, back pain, predominantly, as mentioned, not so much leg pain, more paresthesias, um, you know, pretty, pretty healthy woman. Um, and obviously, there's some past medical history, you can see all that. I'm not going to read it off for the sake of time, but her exam was pretty unremarkable. Her strength was fine. She did have some L5 uh, sensory diminution. Um, she was only taking Tylenol and gabapentin. Um, she had, you know, failed all of the standard conservative treatment, and this was her, her standing um, AP film. And then, not letting me, see. all right, hold on, there we go. Um, here was her lateral neutral film. Um, and I also included our, our VAS um, pictograph for everyone to see. But um, the the thing that kind of jumped out for me was obviously the, the severe collapse at 5.1, but also her sacral slope, which I measured as about 43-ish degrees. Um, I have the dynamic films as well here. Um, here's her MRI, isolated degenerative changes um, at 5.1. Um, the sets looked pretty well preserved, no significant um, stenosis, maybe a little left foraminal um, narrowing, but again, nothing, nothing too severe. And um, I, you know, pretty much always get a CT scan um, for, for workup um, now with all my arthroplasty cases and in part also to measure, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, I can kind of get a feel for the size of the implant, make sure there's no bridging bone. Obviously she has those lateral osteophytes. So, um, she, she really didn't want a fusion. Um, that was one of the reasons she had um, come to, to be seen with, with us and with me. Um, so um, I, you know, I will say that for me, um, it was a bit more of a sacral slope than I um, generally um, would, would maybe think um, about uh, arthroplasty, but I, I felt like um, I could restore the height and, and get this remobilized if the set joints looked okay. And so this is what I did. Um, I did choose to put the keeled Activel in, um, again, given the considerations of the of the sacral slope. This was our two-week post-op visit, um, the x-rays that I took then. And um, here was her uh, VAS um, at seven weeks. Um, minimal low back pain at this point, um, no, no leg pain. And then um, I saw her not too long ago for her one-year post-op. She's completely pain-free. She's back to all of her activities. Here were the dynamic films. Again, you can really see when she's flexing um, how significant that <laughs> slope is. Um, but um, but yeah, she's she's doing great. Everything has um, has been well, and so I thought, okay, you know, this was this was definitely uh, in the win category at this point. Um, so my second case, it's a 57 year old female um, came to see me um, from uh, one of my referring um, uh, physiatrists that. Um, had been following her. She'd had nine months of left-sided neck pain kind of radiating into the periscapular area, some paresthesias in her arm, kind of a C6, C7 distribution on that left side, um, kind of a mix of neck and arm pain, had done the conservative treatment, one of those, you know, I did PT, but it, quote, made me worse. Um, she had some epidural injections targeting C5, 6, and C6, 7, with some limited relief, but, um, but basically was still um, still pretty, pretty disabl disabled and um, felt that, you know, she was just not getting any better. Um, of note, she did have some carpal or some cubital tunnel rather that had been diagnosed on, um, on nerve studies. So you saw her x-rays. Here was her presenting pain drawing, um, again, with that combination of neck and left arm pain. Here are her dynamic films, you know, spondylosis and collapse at 5, 6, 6, 7, a little retrolisthesis there at 5, 6. And then this was her MRI that was available, the mid-sagittal um, cut here, axial cuts through five, six, and six, seven. Again, you know, definitely some, you know, left greater than right foraminal stenosis. Felt that it all was consistent with her symptoms. 
CT for, for kind of measurements and surgical planning, making sure I'm not missing any posterior osteophyte or anything along those lines. And then again, here's the axial cuts at C5-6 and C6-7. Um, actually, it looked to me worse on the right than the left, but she wasn't having symptoms on her right side from a bony standpoint. So this is what I did. Um, Two-level simplify reconstruction. Um, this is the two-week post-op imaging. Um, I was pretty pleased with the height restoration. I thought I, you know, definitely made her look a lot better as far as having some cervical lordosis as well at this point. Um, and this was her BAS and, and drawing when she came in at the first visit. Really minimal neck pain, just kind of some soreness and no arm pain. Six weeks post-op, she came in and said, you know, my arm's bothering me, but she said, I really don't think it's related to my neck. I think it's my shoulder um, or my cubital tunnel. So I said, well, let's just keep an eye on this normal exam, nothing that really jumped out, but obviously, you know, pain drawings now gone from no arm pain to what she's saying is six, but she, she said she thought she was better, but she did not think this was her neck. So I said, well, come back. We'll see you at the three month visit. She didn't come back until eight months, at which point she's now having some neck pain, still having that left arm pain. Here were the x-rays. thought there was maybe a little little loss of height, six, seven, maybe a little bit at five, six, pissed early as well. Um, and in the meantime, she'd gone back to the hand surgeon for her cubital tunnel eval. And he felt like, yeah, I don't really think this is all your cubital tunnel. Um, he sent her for all this workup, uh, unbeknownst to me, you know, she's getting EMG studies that showed some C7 auriculopathy, did PT, um, had an injection by one of their physiatrists. And, um, and then when she came back to see me at this point, she was having some triceps weakness on the left. Um, this was the MRI. Um, and, uh, you know, again, no, no central stenosis. I felt that all looked better. And, and these were the axial cuts at five, six and six, seven, which, uh, you know, I, I thought looked better than her pre-op, but she was undoubtedly still um, having some symptoms on that left side. And, you know, definitely, some, you know, some pyramidal narrowing, um, really on both, but this was the CT. Um, and then the axial CT cuts, which um, I thought that the frame in on the left at 6.7 looked better than the right frame in at 6.7. But nonetheless, she was, you know, she told me she felt debilitated like before surgery um, and basically was just not, you know, not pleased with where she was. So I told her, I'm going to send you to one of my one of my partners and, and, you know, see if he thinks that maybe maybe there's a role for a, a posterior foraminotomy. Um, she saw him and, and he did um, he did suggest that you know they'd go forward with it she has not had that yet as far as i know but anyways this is one of those where i you know initially had felt really great about um thought everything looked pretty good and kind of came back to where it was one of those you know did, did we lose some height what happened but kind of felt like this is one that i never never really loved at the end so those are my two so come at me great slide um can i ask you can i, can I ask oh, a ahead. question Scott? you can ask whatever yes so, you know, in the beginning, when we started first doing arthroplasty, I think we were less careful about doing bilateral foraminotomies. And did she initially have right arm pain or left arm pain? Left. Never had any right symptoms. Okay. All right. So, you know, if you looked at your MRI scan and the CT, you know, yet it looked a little bit better. But I think that we were probably a little too timid about doing a foraminotomy. And you really have to take that posterior third of the uncus. And I'll show that actually on one of my slides. Um, but it happens. I Listen, I've had many patients that, you know, they do great for a while and then they get a little subsidence of the of the implant and they will all subside a little bit. It's just one of those things. And I, I've become much more aggressive. Blake Staub, one of our neurosurgeons talks about, he, he goes until he can feel the pedicle below. Well, I've always been too much of a chicken to do it, but recently I've been doing that. And since I've been doing that, I have, I think I'm doing better for aminotomies. There are a couple guys around the country that do complete uncusectomies when they do their disc replacements, um, which I think is frankly crazy, but it is what it is. Um, you know, the, that was the number one reason in the Rush study that was presented C-spine research a couple years ago. Their number one failure was, was posterior foraminal stenosis. Um, Peter is doing a study with our patients um, at TBI. And I think our incidence is going to be really a lot lower than the rush study. It's probably be between one and 3%. It's, it's actually very small. And I think it's because what Rick said is 
now we're doing foraminotomies bilateral, even if, even, you know, whether you've got to do them symmetrically. And that's what we kind of tell the fellows. My question for the arthroplasty guys, and this was on your first case, Jess, is what's your upper limit for sacral slope when you say no artificial disc, you do an ALIF? Uh, and Terry. Yeah, Terry, you, you have know, a number. More, yeah. more, more than the sacral slope in this case is the incidence angle that is almost 80 or more. Very, very high incidence angle. So we we focus on the neutralization of the shear forces. I think the most important is to put is to put a very high uh, inferior plate. I am used to to the eight degrees. Uh, I have no experience with the with the active air, but the fact is that it. That there is no after surgery mobilization. The incidence angle is the same in post op, but with the recreation of uh, that means uh, kill, killing the retroversion of the pelvis, we can and you sh you have done you put the heads of the of the of the females in a better position after that, but. That is the price to pay is to increase the lordosis that was not uh, uh, typically in the agenda of the patient because uh, first all his life he has been in retroversion uh, to avoid any posterior so we increase the posterior uh, contact so I am not sure that uh, I am a, a great fan when there is a big incidence to. To put a disc after that, and to put a mobile core disc, absolutely not. But it's my uh, okay. That's my philosophy. Yeah. But in those cases where you have a vulnerability with a, a big slope, it's better to fix the core and not to use uh, viscoelastic or a mobile core okay, because we have to face an anatomical problem and not only a pathological problem. We have a pathology in the one, but we have an anatomical problem with a large incidence angle. So that's okay. why that's why I would have I, I would have used a preferred to not to fuse perhaps, that? not to fuse perhaps because the disc is uh, uh, is accessible. Uh, the disc above are very good, so it's good. Okay, it's a good choice to put it this, but here probably I would have chosen a. I would have been glad to systematically choose a fixed core, and not to ask me the question, "What should I right. do?" And, and you know, I, I, um, I hundred percent agree that if her sizing had allowed for the protest, um, I, I would have done the protest, um, for the sake of just that more constrained, um, less you know facet potential shear. But she, you saw this CT measurement. She was measuring like, you know, right around a 26. And so that's why I chose the Activel with the yeah, heel. Yeah. I, I completely it's, agree with everything you're yeah, saying. I agree that size limited. I, I, give, I give my arguments about the, the choice. That doesn't mean another choice is not a good one. It's just my All right. so do, do we think So do we think with a higher lordosis, a fixed core is a better choice? Let's ask uh, for my Jack. Part, yes, but for well, my we know Terry's part, answer. We know Terry's yes. answer, but he he thinks he's a fixed core guy mostly. But Rick and yeah. Jack, do you think that uh, well, that you would you, know, you would say I'll, that that makes a difference a fixed core versus a mobile core with a higher sacral slope? I you know I both think, of the implants have higher good. inferior end plates that you can lessen the sacral slope. So I'm not sure it makes any difference if you can, you know, give them a six degree end plate on the bottom or an eight like the protus. So, you know, with the, when we did the charité, we used to do like seven and a half, 10 degree on the bottom. Would any of you have done a fusion instead of an ADR on this? No, my, my number is 45. So 43, that's, that's, that's when the yeah, sweet spot. Yeah, 43 is close to 45. Let me ask you, Jessica, this is Jens Chapman. So this is, these are both great cases and thought-provoking. 
Can you go back to the coronal CT pre-op on that lumbar spine? I mean, this was an extremely spondylotic segment, and I applaud you, and I've done those myself, but there's a world of difference of a patient with this kind of a severe osteophytic spondylotic ridge uh, compared to just the normal distant generation patient. So all alignment issues aside, yeah. When is too much, too much, um, if I may just ask like that? I applaud you for doing this technically well done, but this is just a, boy, there's a lot of work in getting that mobilized. Yes, we it do it all the time. I, I, you know, I tell these, I mean, I tell every patient, but especially in these types of situations, I, I tell the patient, if I can't mobilize this, you're, you're going to end up with a fusion when you wake up, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean. Like, and how often does that happen? Um, not hey. often. I mean, but right. you know, it's like, again, it's like, you know, you start to push your individual limits a little bit, you know, as you progress. And I mean, this was why I showed this case, because I felt like combination of the collapse, the angle, this was definitely not something I think should it be anyone's first, second or 10th case, you know, but, um, and, and, it, you know, it, it right. could have gone the other way. I was fortunate that at this point, this one has gone well. So we'll, we'll hope that that's all right. We're so, going to leave the budget. Yeah, yeah, we got to move on. I, I, I had trouble. I've got internet trouble, but I'm back in and the time okay. is switch time. All right, Rick yes, Meyer. You, you went into my time, but anyway. Okay. So uh, this was a gal who was 47-year-old, long history, low back pain. Uh, she started getting neurogenic claudication over the last six months and then was having bilateral leg pain. And you can see she's listing to the left. She has a degenerative spondy at four or five, a really degenerative disc at three, four, and a markedly degenerative disc at L5S1. And her MRI scan showed she had severe stenosis at three, four, very severe at four or five with the widened facets. And L5S1 uh, really was just a very, very degenerative segment. So somebody had offered a three-level fusion and I said, well, she's 45, maybe we can save her a level. Uh, and I thought about doing a hybrid. So I ended up doing a hybrid and two weeks post-op, she was complaining of new left leg pain. And we did her, put her on all the usual medications, but also I looked at her x-rays and I didn't like the way it looked like the L5 was positioned on S1. And um, I got a little nervous. So I, I think I sent x-rays to Terry and he said, oh, don't worry, it'd be fine. But I get a CT scan, and if and this is just on, I think, the left sagittal, and you can see how there's barely opposition of the L5-S1 facet joint. And you can see that uh, on the axial as well as the uh, other one. So they're like, whoa. And I think I sent Terry this as well, and he said, just hang in there. I think I showed it to Jack and Scott, and it was just, you know, leave her be. Uh, so... I did text Terry and he said, told me that facets can remodel. And he, this was from his younger years. He showed me a case or sent me the x-rays where the facet joint was totally removed. He did a, a hybrid procedure and at the four or five level, she remained stable. And it looked like there was something, not a facet joint, but something came back as you can see in the far right. So um, I followed closely with x-rays. I'm like nervous as a cat thinking that I need to do a posterior fusion. Finally, you get a CT scan at eight months. And to my surprise, if you look at the left screen, the eight month one, she starts to get hypertrophy of the facet joint compared to the two week post-op one. So she now comes back at a year later and this is what her x-rays look like. It still looks like about a millimeter of anterior listhesis. She has no back pain, no leg pain. She feels happy. She stands straighter. Her scoliosis, you know, it wasn't severe, but she's uh, now straight. And, um, but I get the flexion extension and she still is moving quite a bit. So, you know, the saga still goes on. And what I've learned in smaller patients, distraction may lead to instability. Facet joints can remodel, according to my friend, Terry Marnay, and I've seen it firsthand. And my question now is, when do I pull the trigger to intervene on a patient that's totally asymptomatic that does have rocking and, you know, millimeter or two of lantern listhesis? So is it a defeat? Well, she's pain free. Is it a triumph? No, she has instability at L5S1, but more to that in the future. Now, I'll go to the next one. And this was a 45 year old patient from uh, 
Austin, who had a year of right scapular pain, had tingling in both his hands and feet, and he had an MRI scan that showed that he had severe cord compression at C5-6, and on the axials, you can see it looks like a soft disc uh, with severe compression there, and the surgeon in Austin uh, does a uh, an arthroplasty, and um, the patient doesn't get any better. So finally, um, he ends up getting a CT scan, and this was toward the uh, fall, and it shows that he still has very severe compression, and there's a lot of bony compression. And on the sagittals, you can see the nice speaking, and in the lower right, he has a small central herniation that just, you know, slightly displaces the cord. So he comes to me, and um, on examination, he had signs of myelopathy, and he had exactly the same symptoms, still the paresthesias, hands and feet, and the scapular pain. And I show this picture because, uh, you know, we talk about doing decompressions. And, you know, if you have to take off a big chunk of bone and then you can't reach with the two millimeter kerosene, you really have to almost do a, uh, a wedge type of resection. And it, you're just not going to leave enough space for the, um, for the implant itself. So what we did, uh, we ended up doing that kind of resection. We did an anterior and body fusion. The four or five level, I did do the disc replacement. You could say I didn't have to do that, but the thing is he's been through one operation, got no better. Um, and, you know, he was still was having his, you know, uh, com cord compression symptoms. So we did the surgery. He's now three months out. He says uh, his scapular pain is better. The paresthesias and his feet are still there, but getting better. But when he came back to see me, he wasn't even complaining of his neck. He said, you know, my back is really bugging me. So the moral of the story is that when you see this degree of stenosis, always get a CT scan. And I think that Jack showed in the first case, you know, you need to get CT scans on these neck. The MRI scan will, you know, come back to bite you. And uh, if you look in retrospect, I think he probably was not a good candidate for a disc replacement. And the second lesson, I think, is you need to do what you set out to do. In other words, do your decompression. And especially with the uh, disc replacement, you have to do a bilateral uh, foraminotomy, and you have to get that posterior one-third of the uncus out. And the last thing is always listen to your patient and, and never delay evaluating them because you may see it as a sign of failure. This poor guy kept complaining, complaining, and it was months before he finally got a myelogram CAT scan. And I'm not blaming the other surgeon. Listen, we, we, you know, we all see patients and, you know, we're busy and, and you don't think about it, but, you know, we really do need to give them the benefit of the doubt and, and to get another study. So, you know, you never know how surgery is going to come and bites in the back. So I'm going to stop there. And I think I'm within my time frame. And let me unshare. Okay. Unshare. Let's see. Okay. All right. Terry, so what do you think about that case with the instability? Tell me, uh, am I ready to do the posterior uh, fusion order? Or is I keep on I watching her? I think we have lost a little bit some time with the uh, with the total disc replacement. We have uh, lost, and in our education, we focus a lot about choice, education, placement, what kind of disc. Oh, the first goal is to decompress first. That's the most important, and. Uh, we we cannot even it's a temptation. I have got and I've made the same mistake that this guy to 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 push too much uh, uh, the replacement and uh, without sacrifice of the of, of the decomposition, but probably more more obsession about the this and the no no first time is to decompress, and as long as you have not decompressed. You cannot choose what is your reconstruction. That's very important. Okay, if, if it is a disc herniation, it's okay. If I can get it and if I can pick that up, okay. If it is a, a posterior small decompression, small stenosis, uh, even a foraminal, it's okay. A big compression like that, we, that's, is, that's frightened me to decompress. You cannot put a five millimeter uh, uh, carousel in the canal because there is no there is no room, so it would be difficult. You perhaps have to to start with the burr, and after that, uh, 
uh, alternate between the burr and the carison and the and the hooks and the curette. Okay, when you have finished your decompression, you think what remains? Is it more instable than before? Yes. So is it a good case for? I will not. I will not say like uh, there are beasts that if I fuse, I will see the osteophyte that disappears. Uh, that is a uh, urban legend for me, but uh, uh, because it never happened. If you don't, if you don't decompress well, even you put a fusion, the patient is doing badly. But here it was probably too much, and uh, really too much. But yeah, this is it, the worst. we have the result it, of the race. <laughs> and and I think I think you know he didn't do a C he should have got done a CT before he did his disc replacement yeah. and I think that would have shown him what he needed to do. Now Terry, yeah. I want to ask you a question about no, the second case. There is no information about the importance of the release and resection we have to do from MRI. There is no information. MRI shows the composition of the core, but it shows the core, doesn't show the volume of the osteophyte, really. And it's, it's, uh, and it's very important because you don't see it because uh, the more calcified is the osteophyte, the less water there is inside, so the less vision you have about the bone because uh, it's uh, it's a water content that defines uh, the gradient of, vi of visualization of the MRI. So it's interesting systematic dig to have a, a mineral CT scan on the big corporation like that. There is, the, and it's a good base because after that, if you control it, it's better to have a, the same image and you can compare. So it's, uh, if it doesn't work like that, you are very glad to be able to compare image with image on the same machine with same radiologist to say, okay, my decompression was good or not. That's for me very important. That's why you see in my in my presentation often uh, the mineral CT scan, but I think it remains in those cases a very very important information. And Terry, there's we a routinely... question in the chats. There's a question in the That's chat good. box on the lumbar case um, from yeah. uh, Jason Cuellar and also Jens. Um, why didn't you do disc replacement at three, four, and four, five on that case? Um, because of insurance. Fair. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not a good answer for the patient, but that's the world we live in. But just to hammer the point Terry was making, I mean, we can send every arthroplasty patient for a potential fusion. Um, but the ones who have a lot of bony disease, we make sure that we are very clear to them that the decompression comes first. And if we have to remove a bone, to do a good decompression that we're not comfortable doing an arthroplasty, they have to understand that they will get a fusion. So I think, you know, we need to do that to cover ourselves, but in every case, because you never know when something could happen that you don't, you don't anticipate. But when you know it's going to be a tough decompression or there's a lot of spondylotic disease, I think it's important the surgeon and the patient uh, look each other in the eye and you make sure the patient is on board. May I agree yeah, with and, your point? May I agree and disagree? I'll disagree, um, I'll agree with your point. And I think for whoever the surgeon was, it was the wrong decision not to do a fusion. But I don't think that's in, in an experienced arthroplasty surgeon's hand. I don't think that was too much osteophyte to get back there with a two millimeter kerosene, get those anterior, you know, get those superior and inferior osteophytes off and still have enough end plate to do an arthroplasty. I just think it's just a matter of experience. Scott, you know, it, we used the drill to get back there and we we did take a big chunk off. I would have been concerned that you wouldn't be able to, to get a good seating for the arthroplasty. And, um, you know, and I, on that one image I showed, how it went up about a third of the body. I think there's a real hard to get with the two millimeter. The, the most okay. also important is with these big lateral osteophytes to have a look to the vertebral artery because... Uh, if there is some uh, limit uh, with a, uh, there is a young and care uh, syndrome, uh, it's interesting to to think that restore the motion on those cases with an osteophyte not so far from the vertebral artery is perhaps not, the, <laughs> is perhaps not. Even we decompress the foramen for the for the nerve, we don't decompress laterally for the 
or the vertebral artery. So it's, it's, if it is too big and too lateral, it's better to, it's better to fuse. Well, these were great cases, good discussion, but uh, per our agreement, it is Dr. Blumenthal's quarter hour coming up. He's he's pushing. <laughs> so take it away, Scott. Absolutely. All right. So I've got two cases, and I apologize. I'm going to have to stop sharing and then reshare between cases. And what I'm going to bring up here is interesting, hopefully, interesting discussions on decision-making in revision of cervicals. So you know, and and the first case brings up the point of what happens when you have a wonky looking cervical arthroplasty and the patient has continued mechanical symptoms, what criteria do we use to decide on a revision? And, you know, this one, the first patient's 47 year old with, with a, a two level arthroplasty done remotely from, from TBI uh, who present with uh, a long time history of continued mechanical symptoms without neurologic deficit. And so what we have here is a two level MOBI. And um, you can see here, I think the sizing is reasonable. I don't think it's over distracted. Um, but on flex and extension, there's 16.3, a little bit over 16 degrees of motion at one of the segments. So, you know, the concept of hypermobility has been brought up um, and, and, you know, we're trying to figure out axial symptoms and a disc that maybe doesn't look right. Where do we revise? Where do we not? So, you know, nothing too fancy on the CT scans, no obvious pathology, nothing on the MRI scan as well. So the question is, what do we do? You've got axial symptoms, you've tried non-operative treatment, um, and how do you kind of convince yourself that this is a person for a revision? We've all had patients that, you know, we don't have perfect positioning, they go somewhere else and the surgeons say, oh, well, it's not perfect, so that must be your source of pain. Well, there's this nice study done um, by Pat Warden that I think Rick and Jack both participated in this study, that tried to create some standards for what hypermobility might be in terms of perhaps, you know, a non-optimal result, and it's more than 16 degrees. And on this particular circumstance, what I decided to do was to revise just the hypermobile segment. Um, I've done this in a couple of circumstances where segments have been a little, you know, coronally misoriented, things like that. But, you know, without real criteria, I don't really feel comfortable saying just because you have a, you know, slightly off looking arthroplasty, that must be your pain. So this was the circumstance here. Patient did fine. As per our protocol, we culture all these people for C acnes. And we've learned from the revision um, deformity uh, literature that about 20% of patients are going to have these unanticipated cultures. Um, this patient cultured negative um, for C acnes and um, did fine. So, you know, I guess a triumph. Um, what I'm going to do is stop sharing and then reshare again with a different case, and then we can discuss. And this is a, a little bit different uh, type of circumstance. Uh, here we go. All right, next interesting case. Um, this is a patient who'd had a two-level M6 implant in 2020. And uh, <laughs> Jason's on this, uh, uh, on this uh, Zoom, so he's going to know this patient because we kind of shared this patient. Went back and forth for a very large number of years. And patient continued to have some symptoms. Um, it, it's, you know, again, it, it's some patients just have axial symptomatology after their arthroplasty and has, you know, a reasonably good looking two level cervical M6. I think it was done outside the US. Um, the, the patient kind of, you know, was very a little bit kind of engineering type and loved his arthroplasty at six, seven, thought his five, six was off to the side and was really kind of focused on the on the 5.6, um, saw him initially, and as per our workup, 
um, we do a CT scan in patients that aren't doing well after arthroplasty to look, you know, particularly with the M6 um, for osteolysis. And here in 2021, patient really didn't demonstrate any osteolysis. So at this point, um, myself and, and I think Jason as well said, you know, it literally looks pretty good. You know, you, you might want to try some further non-operative treatment. This you don't really have a, a great indication for revision. And if we did a revision, I don't know that you'd be all that happy with us anyway, because, you know, this looks pretty good. Um, again, uh, MRI scan didn't show other disc levels to, you know, to look for potential sources of um, symptoms. Um, so, you know, we just said, we're just going to follow you. Well, segue to 2023, and you look at the C67 level, and now you're seeing the rather typical picture of osteolysis that we've come to see with, you know, anywhere from 10 to 40% of the M6 cases uh, that are done with, you know, intermediate to long-term follow-up. Don't see any osteolysis at C56. Um, you know, again, some other issues. So what are the options at that point? Um, Explant both and convert to fusion. Explant just six seven to fusion because that seems to be the pathologic level. But in this era of a higher incidence of C acnes, now we found in our series at TBI that the osteolysis cases have a higher incidence of C acnes than just the harder removals. Where you know perhaps a harder removal with osteolysis might have a twenty percent incidence. When you have osteolysis, it seems to be more like a 60 to 80% incidence of C acnes. So should we do both? Um, or explant both. Six, seven, obviously osteolysis, we, we tend to gravitate towards fusions with those levels and maybe just you know do a disc to disc at C5, 6. Um, again, we're going to discuss this at the end, but you know what I opted to do after you know, a lot of discussion with colleagues uh, was to treat the pathologic level, the osteolysis level at C67. Um, the disc, when we encountered it, had a very typical mode of failure, which was um, fraying of the polyethylene strands of the of the kind of the annulus recreation, um, you know, the beginning of failure at the junction of the strands uh, and, the, and the metal end plate, very typical mode of failure. Um, and converting it to a fusion after, you know, burring out the, the osteolysis, you know, the, the, the periprosthetic cysts, doing the cultures, et cetera, you know, culture for two weeks. Interestingly enough, it didn't take two weeks. At four days, this, this fellow came back positive for C. acne. So we did a complete uh, six-week course of uh, doxy. And he really had an uneventful post-op course. But the question is, since one was infected, should we have done both? I don't know the answer. This is the, the x-ray showing the healed uh, fusion. So I'm going to stop at this point and um, open for discussion. Hey, Scott. Um, both great cases, but I have a question. You know, the gal that you uh, took the Moby C out that had the 16 degrees of motion, do you have post-op uh, flexion and extension, because I remember seeing those x-rays with you, and I said, what does she look like today? I'd just be curious. I know she's clinically better. So, you know, in, in, um, we, we obviously were just at Spine Society of Australia a couple of weeks ago, and we were presenting a bunch of these cases, as were they. And, you know, the, the surgeon there who had a lot of experience said, well, if one of them gets osteolysis, you should probably do both. And then on a case like hypermobility, they said, well, once you fix the hypermobility at one level, what if the other level becomes hypermobile? I don't have long-term enough follow-up on the Moby case to know if the next, you know, if the level that was not hypermobile then becomes, you know, and that's why I brought these cases up is should we be revising both on a two-level case or is just treating the levels that at this point either, you know, uh, are have indications either through osteolysis or Pat Warden's classification of hypermobility. I don't think that answer is out there yet. And that, that's why I thought these were two cases. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting because, you know, you would think that she probably would still have that degree of instability, but, you know, why she was hurting with the Moby C and not with the uh, Simplify, but yet that was a six week follow up. Scott, why didn't yeah. you use a more, why didn't you use a more constrained disc to revise it to if, if you were revising it purely for segmental hypermobility? 
why did you put another disc in that is kind of biconvex and um, you know is a little uh, less constrained than uh, other discs? So the majorities of the revisions that I've done disc to disc have been to you know what we call the OG, the original Pro Disc, um, because it is just you know one one point of motion. Um, but but this person as well as a couple others were smaller females and the and that smaller size that four millimeter simplify seemed to fit them better i actually had both you know both sets in the or ready to do either one um but from a sizing standpoint on a smaller female this this seemed to to fit her better and post op and and again we need longer term follow up i've not seen you know we've not seen hypermobility yet with with the simplify like we do with with the moby and Maybe we will, but you know, again, this is this is more asking questions than giving answers. Hey Scott, this is Ian. So both are very instructive cases um, for their own rights. Let's start with the hypermobility case. So, did you have any insights from, let's say, facet blocks, um, rhizotomies, et cetera, to kind of localize that, or is that a purely radiographic assessment? Yeah, most of the time, the workup, and and we'll do, you know. We'll we'll do the CT. We'll do the MRI. We'll do the facet blocks. None of them were magic. So you know, I know that that a lot of people, if they get magic response to facet blocks, say, okay, that's a fusion candidate. We should just do that. You know, again, this is this is so early in our literature on revision arthroplasty. You know, I've got more questions than answers. But in this particular case, as as, as in a lot of the hypermobilities, the facets have not been kind of like aha moments where that's my pain. Scott, there's a question in the chat room. Do we depend just on the culture or the microbiology to make the diagnosis um, of an infection or do we get histopathology? Do you send tissue also looking for inflammatory response or infectious evidence? I have not, except on the the obvious osteolysis cases, the M6. Those are the, I send all the if there's osteolysis, I'll send histopathology, but just a revision for either an over, you know, a you know, bad sizing of a disc or hypermobility. I have not. I just do a C acne's culture. And again, you know, based upon the revision deformity literature, you know, we don't even really know what to do with that information because because the incidence is in, in asymptomatic, whatever, positive cultures, we don't know what that means. So hey, Scott, most of us, go ahead, go ahead, Rick. Scott, you, you alluded to it a, a little bit ago, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are because I still can't figure it out. So a patient that has a two-level M6, one has obvious osteolysis, the other one looks perfect. I know you talked about, you know, the decision, you take the other one out. Why do you think one gets it and one doesn't? I mean, it's kind of weird. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it it happens when the disc fails, which a lot of people yeah, say, well, inevitably the other disc is going to fail. So why don't you do both? Um, you know, the instance of osteolysis with the M6 is, you know, lowest 10%, highest 40% based on the second Australian study. But so are you taking out 60% that really don't need to be taken out? I, I just don't know. Or with enough time, will, will they all fail again? I don't know. I mean, I, this is this is way early in our learning curve. And what's your opinion, Scott, and, about the uh, whether C. acnes is just an opportunistic uh, colonizer or a primary um, infectious agent? I'm I'm starting to lean towards it's just an opportunistic agent. And and by the way, Jason also points out that the in, if you go in the center, and Rick can probably answer this better than I, um, that the four millimeter simplifies not much different than a five millimeter posterior height disc. It's, it's all how you measure it. Rick Rick knows this more than I do. Yeah. You know, the, the simplify is measured from the anterior posterior margin, but remember it is very convex. So it can actually give you a little bit higher height. Now, if you use the pro disc, which is very flat, if you use it in a convex or a concave end plate of a disc, you're going to get a you know a higher height. So it depends on the patient's shape of the implant as well as the implant surface. So 
you know, four millimeter may be a five and a, a five millimeter pro disc could be less depending on the shape of the implant. So it, it's one of those things that you have to look at all the parameters. Well, I, I think our time is uh, running out. Uh, you know, thank you to all the presenters for sticking to the format and um, for having uh, very good cases, good discussion. Thank you to Dr. Marnay, who is staying up uh, very late for us. You are a gentleman thank you, and Terry. scholar. Um, and Corey, you're going to put up some of uh, the CME uh, information for us. And yes, just want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending. And we'll do this again uh, uh, next quarter. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good thanks, evening. Everybody. Good night. Hang on. Thank Here's you. our number. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. One one eight three. Eleven eighty three for your CME. Eleven eighty three. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Corey. Oh, thank you too. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.